think about the future too, but there are so many people we would like to remember. And uh, Ken, you were in a closed environment with Jim Irwin. Now, what does that mean? What draw us a picture? Uh, that was Apollo 15 when you came. Did y'all have to get in the chamber to practice something? What were you doing? It's, no, no, actually, LTA-8, that's Lunar Module Test Article Number 8, and this was a, a fully space-rated um, lunar module and descent module, and uh, it was we put it installed it inside of Chamber B, which was the smaller of the two big vacuum chambers, and we had to have a staircase on the inside. We had a... a uh, an airlock which we could pump down to the same uh, vacuum that the big chamber had, which was 10 to the minus 12 tor for you science people, which means there's about one molecule of air for every cubic foot. In other words, you wouldn't live very long if you didn't have if the door came open. So what we would do is go in the airlock, pump it down with our spacesuits on, of course, and pump it down to 10 to the minus 12 tor, open the inner door, go in, go up the steps, and then we had to get down on our hands and knees to crawl in through the door of the lunar module and then stand up on the inside. Well, um, the the uh, descent stage primary main engine that was fired to, to bring them down the lunar surface and also afterwards to, to fire the upper stage uh, engine to take us on up into orbit to rendezvous with the command module. But um, what I'm going to get at is that the, um, the engine for the ascent stage actually protruded up inside of the, the – um, cabin, if you will, of the of the lunar module. We Some of us would sit on that while we were spending hours inside because the most people don't realize the lunar module was flown standing up because you're in a zero gravity situation. So we had uh, connections on our belts on the sides of our, of our spacesuits. We'd hook those uh, cables that would keep us, our feet down to the floor so we didn't fly or bounce around while we we're using the controls. And it's very similar to a helicopter for the helicopter pilots out there. Because your your uh, right hand was for your your roll, pitch, and yaw um, of all six movements, you know, left, right, up, down, and the left hand was a, a TTCA or a thrust translation controller assembly, which allowed you to traverse backwards, up, down, left, right. So that's what we were testing all of those and using the the RCS or re- reaction control systems, the little small jets that would would cause us to translate along or to roll and pitch and all. It's, it's how you learn to fly. And same thing with helicopter pilots. They've got to have the, the control stick in one hand. They've got to have the other hand on the throttle and a uh, device down on the side of the seat next to them. So helicopter pilots would make great uh, lunar module spacecraft pilots, only we've got better systems now. And we, we can talk about that when we get into a secret space program, TJ. All right. Well, I don't know how much you want to cover tonight, but uh, folks, we're doing this off the cuff, so I'm very happy to say that I'm paying money for Spreaker to load my blog talk radio from New York uh, so I don't have to keep it in my computer, and I'm paying for archiving, which I've done for many years now, but uh, I'm learning how to keep stuff in the cloud and then just pay companies like GoDaddy. I bought some extra, uh, not just shared hosting, but dedicated hosting today. It's going to cost me another $50 a month by the time I'm through. But it's okay because I pay about that here, uh, 40 or 50 I don't know, uh, 40 I think, for blog talk just to get this live two hours a day, $20 on Spreaker. And a lot of other places that like us, we're content providers, and they put us in live and recorded podcasting all over, uh, well, in the Internet space. So uh, FM radio, iTunes, we're on iTunes if you'd like to go to TJ Mars ET Radio. So I have to keep using that name because that's where everything is stored for those of you listening. <clears throat> now, Ken is obliged to coming on Fridays. So we can talk about the people in the Allied Command that he is building of the ancient history and the New Thought history, New Thought Teachings Awakening Consciousness. So we have UFO Secret Space Command that we have started in Facebook as a free social media place, but we're also going to have three tiers of education, and we're going to have webinars, and we're going to certify 
members based on their education profile bio. And we're going to have Norio Hayakawa on soon with his blog he calls Civilian Intelligence. Now, I like to feature intelligence uh, based on the fact that I meet people or I've known people that have worked NSA, CIA, FBI, uh, Secret Service, because I've known a lot of these people. But uh, uh, I also met astronauts. I met presidents of the United States. But, you know, does our history matter? Because when you cross a path, why? We're get, Ken and I are both metaphysicians, to be honest with you, and we're also universal life ministers out of Modesto, California. So we have those uh, pieces of paper if anybody's keeping up. But also we've met people and we're here to help with the future in communications and how we talk to each other and how we share because so many of our friends, I'm 67 and Ken, is. aren't you 77? Let me let you say that. Yeah. I'm 67. Yeah. I'm just getting started. And you're 77. Now, when were you born, for the record, and where? October 1942 at Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, uh, San Antonio, New Mexico, uh, Texas. I'm sorry, Texas. I'm a Texan, I guess. You're born Texas. My children are too. And when I was going to high school from Louisiana, I moved over to West Monroe High School. I mean, from West Monroe High School to James Madison High School. Being a Texan was very important, and I always felt less than because all the Texans were so proud to be Texans. And, of course, when the, later on I, I had horses, we took the horses from uh, West Monroe, Louisiana, Countess, and we had uh, uh, races, not races, shows in Dallas, and then we had some in Houston. And I would go to Pen Oaks Charity Horse Show every year, and I sat in the box with Joan Robinson Hill made quite a splash in Houston after she died, but her husband was still alive and insisted I sit in her booth. I was very pretty and one of their friends, but didn't go over really well at that time. So uh, Ken has small horses that he mentioned when he was talking earlier. And, uh, you know, we know people as equestrians, but this UFO Secret Space Command uh, Commander Johnston, we're going to call him Commander in our ACO uh, Association. We have ACO Club. We have Ascension Center organization for our Ascension Age people that know of what we were doing back in the day. We didn't have Ascension Center. We didn't have Ascension, and we had New Age, and we had them in the bookstores. But I've separated ACO Association for the Health, Body, Mind, and Spirit people. Science, spiritual science, and then we have the UFO Association for people, but Ken can fit in either one. Ken, you can do spirituality, metaphysics with me and ACO Association, health and wellness, and uh, advocate for being an ambassador of goodwill, but you can also do that with me and the UFO Association and the nuts and bolts with NASA uh, unidentified flying objects unidentified submersible objects, and unidentified anomalous phenomena. That's a mouthful. Unidentified anomalous phenomena as UAP. So that's sort of why I chose Ken, because he has a background in space and in flying as a pilot. And I live right here where he went to school at Pensacola, right across the bridge. So we have a lot in common, and I got to work with the Marines, and so did Ken, and they were the ones that would show up on the beach, and then we had Seabees, and I got to work with the Seabees in Hawaii, Ken. So why don't you start about how you see all our military, some of them may want to come on the show, like Don or anybody that's still alive, but uh, what, what do you foresee, and we can use 20 minutes, and then the last hour can be all our secret, UFO secret space stuff. But what do you foresee with uh, the type of people that can help us with all our our allied command? I, I say allied. Do you like that word? Because it's like – I like allied. Yeah, allied. Because that, allied. that brings in everybody. That brings in everybody. It's not just – one of the things I wanted to add real quick, though, is that um, we were talking about um, 
uh, the experienced solar system ambassadors because uh, it's very interesting. That's exactly what uh, uh, NASA had called those of us that were going out to public organizations and giving talks and lectures about what we were doing, going to the moon and, and uh, going up into space and creating the uh, space station and all those things. And uh, very interesting, that's exactly what I was labeled once I got involved with the secret space program, it was a solar system ambassador, which basically I take as meaning it's our job to get the information out to the world and make it to where people can accept the fact. If you go all the way back to H.G. Wells' big – uh, thing in 1938 where uh, he was on the radio and he, he put on this little skit that everybody thought was real. He was talking about an alien craft coming in and landing. I guess it was around New York or what have you. And, and people went into panics. People thought that the world was coming to an end. Few people committed suicide jumping off the buildings. And all this was done just for for fun, what he thought. H.G. Wells did. And then so um, NASA asked um, – one of the, the top universities to do a study to find out what would be the effect nowadays if um, this was back, I should say, back in 19, oh, that would have been 1978, I think, and no, 1968, and um, what would happen if they, they were to discover aliens on the moon or what have you, and the direction came back says, don't mention it because the, the people are not ready yet to accept the fact that we are not alone in the universe. And, and you go back to, um, that was back when the Pope said that no, there was no intelligent beings all over the whole world. Now it's come around in, in the newer uh, age of, of Christianity and, and all. Um, people are recognizing the fact that uh, there, there's way too much evidence and proof that we are not alone in this universe. And now we're getting into the thing of uh, direct contact and what kind of effect that could have upon your religious belief or your particular, your remote uh, feelings, where, what, how would that affect you? And I think that's something we could talk about a little bit later. And if we have people call in, I'd love to hear what other people have to say when we are busy talking about uh, the effect that uh, uh, coming in contact with other intelligent beings here on this planet called Earth. So that's kind of like what I'd like to hear, see us get into in a few minutes. And you have okay. any more suggestions? Well, I'd like to mention that ACO I use for many things as an acronym, but we also have on the planet ACO, which is Allied Command Operations, which is responsible for the planning and execution of all NATO military operations. ACT is headed by the Supreme Allied Commander Transformation, SAT, who exercises his responsibilities from headquarters in Norfolk, Virginia, in the United States. And that used to not be there, but it is now with Wikipedia, which is amazing because it used to not. And the Supreme Allied Commander is uh, the most senior commander in uh, Europe. So uh, we don't want to get confused with all those, but we can't help it now because ACO can stand for a lot of things, and the Allied Command can stand for things. But we're going to educate people about the Supreme Allied Commanders and the Senior Commanders and the General of the Army, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who we talk about a lot in uh... – oh, okay. I hear a bunch of – I'm getting some feedback. Oh, is your is – yeah, your, uh... I'm, wiggling <laughs> I'm wiggling around in my, my rocking chair here, <laughs> so I apologize <laughs> Making a noise. It's hard. Yeah. It's, uh, Ken is learning how to do, it's very hard to sit really still and do two hours of radio, folks. And uh, Ken has agreed to learn how to do it, but it's amazing because when he goes back to hear this on YouTube, he'll hear feedback. So uh, make sure your sound's <laughs> down on your computer. Is it, it's tweaking? I'm not sure. It's why. completely down. No, it's the it's the chair when I turn and I lean backwards. Oh, it's, it? it's, it's the great yeah. It's me. <laughs> well, we recognize it, folks. So, uh, we'll learn how to do this. But the Supreme Allied Commander, the General of the Army, Dwight D. Eisenhower, served in successful Supreme Allied Commander roles. Eisenhower was the Commander in Chief, Allied Force for the Mediterranean Theater. I don't know if everybody knows that. So what I'd like to do, Ken 
is when we talk about us and what we're creating in the future, let's also give the history. 